So several years ago when I was first diving into why humans are the worst breathers in the animal kingdom, I found some research that showed that in just a few hundred years, our skulls have dramatically changed. Our mouths have grown smaller, our faces have grown backwards. So this countered what I had understood about evolution, which was that evolution was this straight line of progress, but it's not because there are no real benefits to having a mouth that's too small for your face so your teeth grow in crooked, having a smaller airway so you choke on yourself, and to have terrible posture. So we're gonna hear from some experts in this field and we're gonna hear about how this all happened, why it happened, and what we can do to fix it. And this is sort of a sampler from various people who are gonna be giving some very quick talks into each of these specific areas. And the first one we're gonna hear from, calling in remotely, is Dr. Shabon Cook. She's an assistant professor in the Center of Functional Anatomy and Evolution at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And she's here to introduce why our ancestors had straight teeth and wide mouths and why we don't today. Siobhan? Thank you for having me today. I um, just finished teaching. It is the first day of our um, anatomy course for the first year medical students and I course direct that so that's why I am here in Baltimore rather than out there in LA with you all. <clears throat> okay so this is a little bit about um, myself. Uh, as he, uh, James said in the introduction, I'm in this, uh, an assistant professor in the Center for Functional Anatomy and Evolution at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And I am trained as an anatomist, uh, a paleontologist, and a biological anthropologist. And my research primarily focuses on dental functional morphology and masticatory anatomy. So the anatomy associated with chewing and food processing. I also have a specialization in primate evolution. And to better understand how evolutionary um, anatomy changes through time, I do lots of shape analysis of crania, of teeth, of mandibles, so that we can understand what these anatomical shapes uh, look like at certain points in evolutionary history. And then I also have a portion of my research that correlates natural normal anatomical variation with pathologic conditions. So for example, if you have a specific uh, anatomical form to your TMJ that's different from someone else, are those, is one of those forms more likely to result say in osteoarthritis over the lifetime of um, your use of that joint? So that's another part of my research. Um, next slide, please. So humans and um, all non-human primates as well, uh, chew and process food with their teeth. And across our group, the primates, animals eat lots of different things. In the um, upper corner there, you can see a very distantly related relative, the tarsier munching on an insect. Next over is a gorilla eating some leaves. We have a spider monkey there eating some um, fruit, some palm fruit. And then in the lower panels, there's a squirrel monkey eating some fruit and one of our closer relatives, the chimpanzee, also eating some fruit and a nice human being eating some salad as well. These diets correlate with dental morphology and dental form. Next slide, please. And what we see across primates are um, different dental shapes associated with how they process food. So for example, this leaf eating monkey, this howler monkey has these really large teeth with big pointy cusps or tips on them, um, lots of crests for grinding up those leaves. And if you compare that with a closely related uh, spider monkey, which eats primarily fruit, they overall have smaller teeth. If you look in closely, you'll see that the crests aren't as long, the cusps aren't as high and as pointy. Um, and overall, the teeth are smaller altogether. Next slide, please. So humans have teeth that look more like that spider monkey. Um, we have smaller teeth relative to body size than um, primates that have very difficult to process food items like leaves um, or uh, 
food that has lots of, of um, tough carbohydrates. But one of the things about human beings is we have an incredibly variable diet. The source of calories across human beings in um, uh, hunter-gatherer populations can range from 10% to 90% meat, from 10% to 80% fruits and seeds. So one of the things that we should remember about human beings is we're omnivorous. We eat all different kinds of things. And all of these different um, types of diets are successful. They keep us alive, they keep us healthy. And um, I've stolen an image here from an article in Scientific American, which was distilling some of the long-term studies on hunter-gatherer populations world over. And this compares um, three different hunter-gatherer groups in different parts of the world. So we have the Inuit in the polar regions, the Iwi in um, Northern South America, and then two different hunter-gatherer populations in um, Africa, the Kong who are in the um, Kalahari Desert and the Hadza who are in Eastern Africa there. And you can see there's a lot of variation in that diet. But one of the things that all of these diets have in common is they're largely undomesticated food items. Um, they are um, usually tough to process, um, require a lot of chewing, a lot of mastication. Next slide, please. And if we compare the foods that we from an industrialized agricultural population eat to what those foods look like, um, historically, you can see there's a big difference. So on the bottom uh, left slide here, you can see a, a wild avocado versus a domestica, domesticated avocado. There's not much to that wild avocado other than seed. There's a little bit of, of food out there. Um, and then here's a wild banana versus a domestic banana. Lots of seed, not a lot of squishy bits. Um, so these domesticated foods are actually much easier to process compared to wild foods. You don't have to chew them as long. They have a higher sugar content. Uh, they're easier to process overall. So you're just kind of mushing them up and swallowing them. Next slide, please. Now what we found, and it's not just me, but lots of researchers have um, contributed to this line of, of work, is that these masticatory influences will influence mandibular shape over time. So if you, from a young age, are eating lots of things that are really tough to process and are chewing for extended periods during the day, you will develop somewhat larger mandibles. Um, and that's in response to the pulling forces that muscles make on the mandible. There also might be some differences that develop in palate shape. So that's the top part of the jaw um, as a result of breastfeeding for a very extended period of time. Some hunter-gatherer populations minimally to age two, sometimes to four or so um, versus bottle feeding. And these uh, changes in feeding have resulted in agricultural and eventually industrial populations and these changes in jaw shape now, we should say that if you as an industrial person um, in the audience um, were to go back to eating like a person who um, is from a hunter-gatherer society, probably your mandible would, if you, you know, were born there, dropped in there as a young child, um, your mandible would look like theirs over development. So we're talking about a relationship between the underlying genes that code, this is how you make a mandible in a person, um, with how that person is using that anatomy over the course of their lifetime. Next slide, please. One thing I do want to note, though, is that we shouldn't romanticize the deep past of where everybody was a hunter-gatherer or wild populations of primates, too. They are not without dental and um, other problems, pathologies that develop. So even though this howler monkey up in this, uh, the top corner A um, ate leaves her whole life, she developed a crooked face for some reason. I don't exactly know why, but that's the specimen from a museum collection. Specimen B up there is a human being from an archeological hunter-gatherer population. You can see they've lost a lot of teeth. Their teeth are really ground down. They do have a nice wide palate um, and they did have room for M3, the, the wisdom tooth in there. <clears throat> Some individuals might develop things like osteoarthritis. You can see that kind of bumpy bone along the mandibular condyle in pi picture C. And then in picture D, 
here's an example of a baboon that lost a tooth, has some dental abscesses. They're, they're, they, when they met that collector for the museum, they were, they were not in good shape dentally. So I think that there's a lot to learn from uh, wild populations of primates and then also from humans that are living in hunter-gatherer societies about how dentition and palate shape and mandibles form as a response between the environment and the underlying genetics. So I will stop for there and uh, pass it on to one of the next presenters. Thank you, Thank you Siobhan. We're next going to hear from Dr. Kevin Boyd. He's a pediatric dentist and visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's here to discuss how the deformations in our faces and airways can occur in the first few years of life, maybe, maybe even, even before, before we're born. Kevin? Um, am I going to advance my slides or can I? I could do that. Would you? you would I, like, I, oh, I like that okay. aspect of it. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, With pleasure. Plus, I like standing next to Why don't you stand over here oh, and I'll so just be up there. Okay. your little work boy over here? Okay. First time. First time for anything. Uh, you ready? Yeah. Let's rock here on. he goes. Okay. I'm not wearing the tie for formality. It's, it's, Hold on. Oh. You're going to do um, that. You've got to follow the rules there. Okay, sorry. Uh, the, the tie is to honor the Beatles and um, a friend of mine. Misha Pesquet's husband, Steve, who gave me this, and I, I don't even pack it my suitcase because I'm afraid of losing it. Um, like the span, you know, the, the gap between health span and lifespan, you can figure out what that is. I mean, lifespan is expectancy at birth, and how healthy do you stay as you age into your older age? Are you healthy or not? And, you know, the goal is to increase life expectancy, but also staying healthier longer. Uh, so, generally, ontogenetic, ontogeny, just means what happens in one single generation. We used to say cradle to grave. Next slide, or no, click it, because I've got animations there. Uh, so, but now we say, no, you know, it's, it's maybe uh, in utero till, till death, or how about preconception? And, and uh, you know, even before that, a woman's eggs start to form when she's inside her mother. So grandma actually can impact epigenetically. Um, you know, men's gametes, they shouldn't be left out of it. I just made a ton of them while I was talking to you. So, we, you know, we, we, we have it a little bit differently. But, you know, women have to take care of their eggs. And they get all the, the, the uh, criticism, oh, you can't drink or smoke and you shouldn't. But men have to take care of their sperm too. Okay, so I'll just leave that alone. I have two daughters and that's how we uh, told them about that. Next, please. <laughs> Click. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about the Dunedin study. Uh, 1,037 kids followed in Dunedin, New Zealand for still going on. Started in 1972. Uh, I'll talk to more about that, of how it affects. Next, please. This is so cool. Thanks, James. Um, <clears throat> obstructive apnea, adverse pregnancy risk. Now, you know, what's going on here? You, most of you have heard of the Barker hypothesis, and that has to do with um, programming in the womb to anticipate starvation. Calories, all right, that's a starvation. There's also oxygen starvation. And we've m developed our own modification of the Barker hypothesis for respiration, respiratory substrate. If a woman isn't breathing right, next, next slide, uh, next click. Um, and, and, and that means snoring, something called gestational apnea. You've all heard of gestational diabetes, hypertension, gestational apnea, okay? And the uh, natural experiment that was done over years was smoking. And they ever, go ahead, next one please, James. Uh, they used to advertise cigarettes as women want to have smaller babies, so smoke, right? So we got to change that thinking. And, and I'll, I'll develop that, uh, the importance of changing thinking, not just therapeutic techniques. Next, please. So when does this start? Perhaps in utero. And we're proposing a study to compare mid-gestational ultrasound profiles to, and, and Christian Guimano was interested in this, uh, to, to what happens uh, in orthodontic clinics. Like, and so that more, more about that later, too, not enough time. Next, please, uh, click. So that's my patient, four and a half years old. 
that's that same kid. And the, and the mom was a dental hygienist, brought her kids to me from Milwaukee, five of them. And she goes, I got another one brewing in here. And she showed me that. And it was her hypothesis. Laura End, her name is. The End Hypothesis. Uh, next, please. So this is in the literature. Smaller faces, retropositioned jaws. This is the Barker hypothesis, OK? Is that uh, apnea of prematurity. Preterm birth is a problem with intrauterine growth restriction. And that is something that, is, that, that correlates with a woman not having good respiration during pregnancy, okay? So there it is, but it, it doesn't say it as such. But uh, you, you can speculate from there. I love it uh, that, that the first speaker that was talking about the ancestral population on that island said, let's speculate back, and, and he did a great job uh, with those questions. Next, please. So here it is. This is an amazing study. It's still going on. They thought it would go 10 years. Uh, our uh, NIH actually invested in this in New Zealand. Uh, so next, please. So here we go, a gradient of self-control. You've all heard of the marshmallow test, right? Now, that means that a kid, and they had validated metrics, and that's why I asked Brett Pottinger about that sit and reach thing, is that they had validated metrics to show that if a kid exhibits good self-control before the age of 11, they, live long, they will live longer speculating. They will stay healthier longer. They know that now because they looked at them at 35 years old. And next, please. Here's what happens, OK? That we, they're projecting that they will live longer. Hit it again, please, James. You're doing a great job, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> so we want life expectancy to increase, but we want the time that you stay healthy into your extended lifespan to last longer, too. It'd be nice to live to 98 then get sick and drop dead at 99 or 100, you know? And that's really where it's going. We can actually, um, with, with really good, not scientific certainty, but, but optimism, that the kids that we treat, that we help sleep and breathe better in early life, that they're going to have a better quality of life short-term, long-term. They're going to live longer, and they're going to stay healthier longer. Watch this. Next, please. OK, so hit it again, please. The, the, the looks, they, the faces age more slowly, okay? These are babies that were born in the 70s. Uh, next, please. Lower chronic non-communicable diseases. Next. Lower criminal behavior. Next. Addiction. How about that, Brett Pottinger? Is that these kids, if they sleep and breathe better, and we're saying because we widened their jaws when they're very young, and, you know, the, this morning they were saying that my kid, you know, at 13 had a, a life-threatening orthodontic need. If that was an orthodontic candidate at 13, that could have been addressed when that kid was two or three or four, when they had 20 baby teeth, usually by two and a half years old. Next. <clears throat> and increased wealth management. Um, I can say everything is referenced here. I can send it. Next, please. So look at that. I mean, even if you just want to look better. How is that? Elasticity of skin. If kids are sleeping and breathing better, you demand from your dentist. Look, if you're telling me to save up my money for braces because my four-year-old doesn't have any space between his teeth and a deep, narrow palate and, and is chinless, um, why can't you do something about it now? At least widen the jaw, if nothing else. That's the easiest dimension to optimize age appropriately. Vertical and you know forwardness, that's different. You can control that young. But Widening a kid and making room for the tongue is what you should insist your dentist. If they don't want to do it, send me to somebody who will. Next. And look at that. I mean, that's not one individual. That's a composite of several people within the study that they've been following. They're still following these people. Next. So childhood sleep problem, they did this in the Dedean study, but they didn't connect it. And I'm working with Dr. Moffitt, and she, you know, we're working on that. Uh, we want to know, is the age, the aging process gets slowed down based upon self-control. There's other metrics that they looked at before the age of 11. Uh, next, please. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, next up is Dr. Scott Solomons. He's a dentist and specialist in functional medicine. 
He's here to discuss why small modern mouths can lead to severe health problems. Would you like me to click your slides for you? Okay. Where's the, uh, where's the thingy? All right. Um, let's figure this out. There we go. Uh, so you don't have to bother taking pictures of my slides. They're live right now on, on my blog right there. Okay, so I'm a general dentist. In a multi-specialty practice, what that means is I'm a, I just kind of do the basic stuff. Uh, I'm sort of the ringleader, the coach. Uh, I diagnose, I see things. And then we have a bunch of specialists that will come in as needed. Um, functional medicine is something I learned about years ago. Um, I think most of you are familiar with Chris Kresser. Sorry to not to see him here. But uh, he, he started uh, the ADAPT program, and uh, it, had, it has an emphasis on uh, evolutionary medicine. So uh, I think that should be critical. It, no matter what um, part of healthcare you, you're in, I think we really need to keep in mind um, our, uh, our genetics and what we're optimized for. Um, and of course, we all just treat patients, okay? People think of dentists as, you know, you treat teeth. Yeah, I mean, that's part of it, but what goes wrong with the mouth, as you'll see today, um, has huge ramifications with the rest of the body. Um, and then, of course, uh, this is not news to anybody here, but hopefully when this goes out on YouTube, um, we need to really be um, believing that the best medicine is to teach how not to need it. Not to say that medicine is all bad. Um, I like to say uh, Western medicine is great when body parts fail, yay Western medicine, you know, as in teeth. Um, and then of course, uh, that last statement speaks for itself. So when we look at the left here, this beautiful ancestral face, they didn't know anything about vitamin B12 or vitamin D, um, but look at that face. That's a perfect face. Um, not to throw this other gentleman under the bus, who shall re remain nameless, but um, <laughs> you know, if you if you look at that face, he doesn't really look unusual. But if he walked into this person's village over here, they might think an alien landed. Um, and you know, there's certain things that that we can see that you know that we're trained to look at this stuff. Um, we can all see. It looks like he's angry. You see his chin. So he can't keep his lips over his teeth without forcing it. So that's, that's lip incompetency. Um, he probably never spent a good day breathing through his nose whatsoever, which made him a great swimmer. Um, and then, you know, that bottom thing, that's, that's kind of the big takeaway because as much as we're concentrating on teeth and jaws and breathing, um, all these things come together in a constellation. And luckily, um, the answer to all of these problems is generally some sort of ancestral approach to life. Um, so Kevin alluded to it, we can straighten teeth, but if they're on a crooked body, it's really a bad idea. Okay, um, let's see, I can, uh, guess I can look at this. So I'm not gonna get too much into this. Um, basically, uh, the consequences of uh, a, a small face uh, small jaws are apnea, but you don't have to have apnea. You can have restricted breathing. There are swallowing problems, speech problems. It, it's all related, but when you look at that list, I could go, I just ran out of room. We, we, we have limited slides. Um, Kevin, talk about self-control. I'm gonna take my five minutes. A um, Couple of studies, okay. Um, the, the person on the bottom right there, that's kind of an obvious thing. I think everybody would, would recognize that. Uh, the gentleman above uh, clearly has apnea. Uh, we, we can pretty much assume that, and, and so a lot of people associate apnea with being overweight or being obese, um, and that, that is true. So when we look at patients quickly, uh, the most important things there, the Malin Potty score is, uh, like how much room you could see, um, behind the tongue, it goes from one to four. I don't have too much time to get into that. But BMI is a big thing, waist, hip circumference, neck circumference, maleness, being over 50. You can almost assume that that person's going to have apnea, okay? But in, in the absence of uh, being overweight, 
there are certain other parameters that we look at, uh, and it would relate more to the size and shape of the jaw. Okay, so this is me, and this is a much more subtle case. So can everybody see the tracing uh, in front of my face there? Is that obvious? So that's a Bolton tracing. That's a composite that they did at Case Western Reserve University, 6,000 kids. Paul Newman was one of them. And they have a tracing for zero, one, two, three, four, five years of age, all the way up to 18. So that's an 18-year-old. But the face is generally done developing, Kevin, what, around 10, mostly? It varies. 10, 11, wait, wait, okay, so that's an 18-year-old, and you can clearly see that my upper and lower jaws are too far back, okay? And then on the left there, I'm, I'm two and a half days out from uh, finishing Invisalign, so on the left there, you can see my teeth were overlapping too much, and uh, that causes the jaw to go even further back, so we're correcting that. And then a big thing that I look at is intermolar distance. 37 millimeters is actually not bad for a, a modern person, but we're getting my tongue, we'll talk about this more later, but getting my tongue more room uh, so that it comes out of my throat because I have apnea. And this is my patient, Lexi. He, she's not actually my dental patient. She, she was referred to me. She couldn't tolerate a CPAP machine, you know, those machines that help you breathe at night. Um, and her heart was enlarged. And, you know, what could she do? And she didn't have a lot of time or money, so we made her that little appliance. That's called the Avant. And it just repositions her jaw forward. And her heart's normal. A dentist did this. So, you know, I'm not Superman, but we treat patients. We, we don't just treat teeth. I think that's the end of that. Yep. Next. Those, those are supposed to be like, those are supposed to be like finish slide. All right, this is starting to feel a bit like the Oscars. We've got a superstar coming up right now. None other than Dr. Mike Mew. He's an orthodontist from London and an expert in oral posture and rehabilitation. He's here to discuss how the way in which we hold our mouths affects how our faces will grow, how we'll breathe, and more. Dr. Mike, you want me to? I, I might do this because okay. I want to do. Um, I want to try and get the slide at the right moment. Where am I going? You're going this way. Yes. There you go. You got me. Okay. So thank you very much. I'm trying to. For me, I was listening. To all Mike, you the mic. Mike. Um, so my father came out with some of the ideas, some of the core concepts that are behind what you've just heard. So I was hearing the stuff 20, 30 years ago, and I've been thinking about how it all comes together. So I wanted a broad brushstroke overview of a process, a pathological process, that connects together everything you've just heard. Because otherwise, if you were without a central philosophy, you're a bit lost. Things don't all tie together to make sense. And so I came up with this concept of craniofacial dystrophy, saying that our faces aren't growing forwards and upwards. They're growing down and backwards. They're down swinging. And the two most important factors here are this soft modern diet gaining a nasal obstruction. So our ancestors went from having this really tough diet to this really soft diet. You've gone from having, you know, I've got a strong jaw, I've got strong jaw muscles. But, you know, you could these days at a cup, you could have a third of your daily calorific intake with no masticatory effort. You know, the mastication we're doing has gone down massively. You know, some people say our ancestors were eating for a third of the physical waking hours. And of course, that's changed greatly. And then, of course, we're getting nasal obstructions. And we, clearly, it's important to keep your mouth closed. The tongue to palate contact is a vitally important, almost like I think of it as a reflex, that tongue to palate contact. Lip seal is, you know, it's one of the body sphincters. You know, don't lose any of your sphincters. They're really important. <laughs> but as much of the importance of your oral sphincter, tongue to palate, breathing is possibly the most important thing you do. So to breathe, you lose those two vitally important reflexes. So you then hang your mouth open, and you've got weak muscles. You've seen someone who has had a stroke, 
the face just lengthens. The whole face lengthens, reducing the cross-sectional area. And as that drops down, you get Y, the long face. Now, so I've tried to put together a 3D model of this. Now, okay, so the thing I think we're not seeing this is because everyone today is affected. You're all affected. You're all deformed. And it's very difficult, you know, it's really a hard thing to get around your head, this. And the reason why you don't get around your head is just because we've forgotten where we used to be. Because the ancestral material had this really good facial form. This has gone from the ancestral perspective, where Scott showed that really good facial growth. Here's the really good facial grower. Okay, that, you can see how it drops down. So everyone's dropped down to about there. Then some individuals carry on down. So that's now the adenoidal face type. But we have to eat, sleep. So we have to talk, eat, breathe. So as the face drops down, depending on your individual way of resting your tongue and your um, mouth so that you can still breathing, you then go, you follow one of these different patterns of behavior. So if you decide that dropping your tongue in your mouth, holding your mandible forwards, is a good method to keeping your airway open, you'll develop with this class three. If you simply hang your mouth down like this, the kind of classical Anglo-Saxon thing to do, you end up with this type of pattern. And if you rest with your tongue in the middle, you end up with this pattern. So you have one overall general schematic of change with modifications depending on your individual pattern of modification. And that's what gets the various different types of malocclusion. But put simply, if a face is not the correct shape, then it does not function correctly. So you have all the patterns of pathological symptoms um, from different, in different areas that comes from a face not growing well. And my objective, not only to get a good overview, my other, perspective, my other goal has been to try and gain change, to try and physically reverse this pattern of behavior, uh, pattern of pathological development. Now, this is life-changing. This is making someone healthy. But it's also incredibly difficult, and it's not very financially cost-effective. You know, whereas I think the value of it added to his life is just extreme. You know, he's going to have a completely different life. I would like to feel we're gaining the best facial changes ever achieved by anyone ever on the planet. But I don't know, because no one will compare the results with me. And that would be nice, because then I'd get some tangible result, but no one will. But I think there's, we've got a pandemic going on. No one's even noticing this is occurring. And it's, it's really affecting people's lives. This is the biggest disease you've all got that you don't know about. Because it's in your face. It is your face. You know, you don't want to admit this. It's uncomfortable to admit it. And that's why we haven't really looked at this before. Okay. And thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Mike. The next speaker doesn't need an intro, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Uh, it's Dr. Robert Lustig. He's the Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology. He's also a member of the Institute of Health Policy Studies at UCSF. He's an expert in obesity and diabetes, and he's here to discuss how modern changes in our faces have impacted our metabolism. Thank, thank you, James. Um, so you've heard about the structural aspects of this. Now the question is, what are the functional aspects of this? How does this ultimately contribute to disease? So we're going to start with this concept that ultimately allies dentistry and medicine, oxygen. Okay, the airway is the conductor of oxygen, and the airway is under assault. That means oxygen is under assault. And how does changes in oxygenation 
ultimately impact on changes in disease. That's what this is all about. So this is what I want you to think about. We all start out as one cell, a zygote. We end up growing into an adult. Okay? How many doublings did that take to go from one cell to 10 trillion cells? The answer is 41 doublings. How many of those doublings occur before birth? And how many of those doublings occur after birth? 36 doublings before birth, five doublings after birth. And I can prove that to you later on with some math. The point is that every cell in our body has to grow at one point in its life and has to burn at another point in its life, but it never does both at the same time. It does one or it does the other. And there are switches for whether it should grow or whether it should burn. What is that switch? Well, one of the components of the switch is oxygen. So Otto Warburg won the Nobel Prize in 1931 for figuring out that cancer cells do not need oxygen. They actually grow without oxygen. They grow by anaerobic glycolysis. They grow by fermentation. So the oxygen tension inside a breast cancer is 44 millimeters of mercury. That's pretty low, right? When you think about the oxygen tension in our uh, blood being 100 millimeters of mercury. The oxygen tension at the top of Mount Everest is 53 millimeters of mercury. Yet the oxygen tension inside the umbilical artery is somewhere between 6 and 31 millimeters of mercury. Thus, Mount Everest in utero. The fact of the matter is the fetus grows the fastest of any organism in the entire world is what's going on before you're even born. All this growth is occurring and it's being done without oxygen on purpose. Because in fact, growth doesn't need oxygen. In fact, growth actually gets in the way. I'm sorry, oxygen gets in the way of growth. This is the phenomenon known as the Warburg effect. So on the left side, you have a cell that's burning. And you'll notice the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria. And oxygen is a cofactor for being able to generate all that ATP through oxidative phosphorylation. On the right side, you have proliferative tissue, either fetal tissue or cancer tissue, that is trying to grow. It's not trying to burn. And so what's happening is that the glucose becomes pyruvate, but the pyruvate's not going into the mitochondria because there's no oxygen. But the pyruvate is still being utilized. What's it being utilized for? It's being utilized for structural components to grow. So you're getting ATP, but you're getting it through glycolysis. You're not getting it through oxidative phosphorylation. You need the pyruvate in order to generate ribose or deoxyribose, in order to make DNA in order to grow. You need the uh, uh, pyruvate to make uh, fat through de novo lipogenesis. That was mentioned by um, uh, one of the speakers earlier, uh, by Dr. Bustos. Okay? For membranes in order to be able to grow. In other words, take this analogy. Okay? You have a house full of firewood. Okay? And that firewood on top, it can do one of two things. You can either build furniture with it, or you can light a fire with it, but you can't do both. Each piece of firewood can be used for one or the other, but not both. Each molecule of glucose can be used to grow or to burn, but not both. And the question is, how does the fetus decide when to grow and when to stop and when to burn? We actually now use this phenomenon of uh, blood, of uh, 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 of hypoxia, of, of getting uh, oxygen tension down in order to grow muscles. This is now being used to treat sarcopenia called blood flow restriction. And you can see the bands on these people's arms for exactly this reason is to be able to increase muscle mass because lack of oxygen increases growth. Presence of oxygen increases burning. Now, there are three enzymes in every cell in your body 
that ultimately dictate the switch. Those three enzymes are, in this slide, first one, PI3 kinase, phosphatidylinositol 3 kinase. This is the spigot that opens the cell to increasing the amount of glucose being imported from the bloodstream into the cell. This is the enzyme that Lou Cantley at Cornell de demonstrated is absolutely essential to cancer growth because you need all that glucose because you're not making it with, you're not burning it with mitochondria, therefore the ATP have to come off the um, off glycolysis in order to power the cell. So you need 400 times the amount of glucose being imported in order to do that because you're not burning it. The second enzyme, AMP kinase. That's the fuel gauge on the liver cell. That's the uh, enzyme that tells the mitochondria to work or not to work. And then finally, the last one is called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. And that's the enzyme that basically tells the cell to either divide or not. Okay? These three enzymes work in concert to tell your uh, cell whether it's supposed to be growing or whether it's supposed to be burning. So we have three enzymes. We have two states, on or off. So in the first uh, column, Okay, that was, by the way, that, that, since three enzymes, two states, that's eight permutations, right? Two to the three. So here are the eight permutations. In the first permutation, you can see PI3 kinase on, AMP kinase off, mTOR on. That's growth. Well, growth also increases the risk for cancer. So that's also the uh, cancer pathway as well. The second path uh, 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 permutation, it's the exact opposite, and that's the burning one. That's the burning pathway. But what you'll notice is that you can have dyssynchrony of those three enzymes in those other six permutations where they're not lined up in one direction or the other, and every one of those leads to chronic disease, as demonstrated by various transgenic models, where each, one of those has been knocked out where the, and the others haven't. In other words, growth and burning are essential to all life, but at different times. And these three enzymes, which are dependent on oxygen, are telling your cells when they should grow and when they should burn. And all of our chronic diseases are dysfunctions of that phenomenon. Well, when we're not oxygenating, we're not burning. We're growing when we shouldn't be. And that, unfortunately, is the basis for how dentistry and medicine ultimately in, uh, uh, combine to impact on this phenomenon of chronic disease. We have to improve oxygenation in order to stop these other processes from occurring. And the question, of course, is how? And that is coming up next. <laughs> All right. We had this set up that each speaker was going to do about a three minute slide presentation. Um, that didn't happen because these slide presentations were way too good to cut off. So we're going to have a very truncated, short version of the panel discussion right now in which I will be able to ask each of these people some questions. And then at the end, we're going to tell you what you can do to fix all of these very depressing problems that were just addressed here. So if the speakers could please come up here. And Siobhan is still on the call. Okay, good, good. So um, the first question that I have for Siobhan is, I thought it was very interesting that she mentioned that Paleolithic cultures had problems with their teeth. And I had heard that, that the very first farming cultures 12,000 years ago was the very first incidence of widespread crooked teeth. And I went to the University of Pennsylvania to the Morton Collection on Kevin's recommendation here, looked at thousands and thousands of of skulls. And I met a researcher there who had been looking at these skulls for years and years and had never seen a hunter gather with, with crooked teeth ever. That's what she said. So I guess the question is, uh, Shabon, do you know what percentage of the population of 
our ancestors, Paleolithic ancestors, had crooked teeth? Was this widespread in certain areas, or was it widespread for certain individuals? Uh, it wasn't crooked so much as having dental pathologies. Um, most hunter-gatherers have very straight teeth and um, usually room in the mouth for the, uh, the wisdom tooth or the M3 as well. Um, but they certainly were susceptible to the things like um, dental abscesses, dental decay. Um, if you're eating a diet that has a lot of grit in it, wearing the teeth down um, to the point where you enter the pulp chamber, that can occur as well in advanced stages of wear and age. But your yeah, the in terms of crookedness, no. The image that I showed, the person would have had pretty nice teeth, but many of them were missing as a result of um, uh, dental abscesses primarily. They had some loss, uh, some uh, bone resorption at the alveolus, that kind of thing. So no, I'll, I'll agree with your assessment absolutely that the vast majority of hunter-gatherers have very straight teeth. Excellent. Um, and one other question for you. I'm sure you're familiar with the work of Weston Price. He was convinced that one of the reasons that we modern people had crooked teeth was caused by vitamin and mineral deficiencies, specifically K2 and D. And I was wondering if you have any uh, comments on that, if that fits in. It seemed like you were talking mostly about mastic mastication, um, not so much vitamin and mineral deficiencies, and if that plays into um, the health of our teeth and jaws. Um, certainly it does. Any vitamin or mineral deficiency can result during dental development in having a tooth um, have structural problems. So for example, uh, not adequate mineralization of the tissue. Now that would happen in, well, starting in utero, but also in juvenility and early childhood, as well as the adult dentition are for, is forming. Um, in terms of um, crooked teeth, if you had uh, uh, mineral deficiencies to the point where it was affecting bone health, certainly it could result in, um, in crooked teeth or um, misplacement of teeth, dental loss, those kind of things. Um, primarily having crooked teeth has to do with having enough room in your mouth for your teeth. And if you have, as um, the other presenters have very nicely laid out, a smaller face and a less prognathic face or a face that doesn't stick out quite as much, you won't have as much space in your mouth for your teeth. And since the space is limited, they start to overlap. They, you know, will turn a little bit sideways or you might have dental impactions at the um, back of the dental row as well if you're talking about molars, second, third molars in that area. Um, so that's mostly about space. Dental crowding is mostly about space. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Boyd, let's talk about a mother's breathing and how that might affect fetal development. This concept of gestational apnea, would you call this a hypothesis? Is this a theory? Is it none of those it, things? It's a pretty well-supported hypothesis in getting stronger. Um, and again, it's a modification, I think, of the Barker hypothesis. This uh, Barker said that in starvation, uh, of calories is that the baby's anticipating being born into starvation and they get something called a thrifty phenotype and they preserve calories, they hold on to them. Well, if oxygen is a substrate, a respiratory substrate, not an energy substrate that's deficient, then there's oxygen starvation in utero. And I feel that a good analogy would just be that the baby's anticipating being uh, born on top of a mountain. And mountain people, and the indigenous cultures that are mountain people, like on you know the Andes, they're very small. Um, the the largest reservoir of mitochondria are the musculoskeletal system, so it behooves them to be smaller, proportional, allometrically scaled in proportion. But they're still, I mean, you know, they're smaller, but their jaws, their tongues fit in their mouths. They're they're not until they get westernized food and living. They don't get crooked teeth. They don't get malocclusion. So um, 
I'm, the other thing that I would like to say is that uh, a tongue is responsible for building itself a home to live in for the rest of its life. And it starts in utero, uh, you know, mid-gestation when they're chewing amniotic fluid. And then when they're born, if they don't develop uh, a palate that's conducive to nose breathing in the first, you know, couple years of life, guess what? They died. That's why we don't see malocclusion in ancestral populations because antecedents to malocclusion, they died before they could even develop malocclusion. So that's just a, a hypothesis. And we don't die. We're here. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Scott, you mentioned something in your slide that you said, we know how to fix crooked teeth, but we don't know how to fix a crooked body. Could you elaborate on that a bit more? Yeah, we, we do know how to fix crooked bodies, and part of it is fixing crooked teeth. Um, so the overarching reason we're here is because of an ancestral approach to health. So I don't want to get too far afield because we're talking about the formation of the jaw, but all these other things you saw on that list come with it. So in the past, we would treat each one, you know, obesity gets treated like this. Unfortunately, usually with some kind of pill or something that doesn't work and high blood pressure gets treated like this and da, 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 you know, on and on and on. Um, we really need to kind of see the big picture and tie all of these things together. So when I see somebody come in with small jaws, I also see the obesity that they bring in with them. And then I do a careful review of their medical history and I see that they have hypertension and we have to treat all of these things holistically. Um, and, and again, that's getting back to the, the functional medicine approach because uh, there's this thing called the exposome. It's, it's kind of a fancy word for saying everything besides our genetics that affects our health and our longevity. Um, so in other words, nine out of 10 ailments that we have are from our environment, whether it's toxic relationships, poor movement, too much sunshine, not enough sunshine. So there's a recipe for a happy, healthy, vibrant human being that I have. It requires maybe six or seven things done correctly all together um, will result in a fully functional, healthy human being. Um, and, and any uh, excess or lack thereof can manifest itself in many ways. Small jaws just happens to be one of them, but typically we see a multiple of things. Dr. Mew, let's talk about craniofacial dystrophy. I can understand how the shape of our faces and our mouths can affect our breathing. That seems pretty obvious, but you also had a list of other things that our poor posture would affect, including our hearing. How does that work? Well, as, as, so as I said, <clears throat> a face that's not the right shape doesn't work particularly well. It doesn't also function particularly well. So as your face down swings, the cross-sectional air is reducing. You're going to struggle to place your tongue fully on the roof of the mouth when you swallow. The architecture and the muscles around the top of the tongue won't contract correctly. Now, you know there's a eustachian tube runs from the middle ear and it runs through to the top of the nasopharynx. And the idea is that whenever you do a correct swallow, you open the eustachian tube. This allows aeration of the middle ear, and that keeps everything healthy. If you can't swallow correctly, and you can't even get your tongue into the correct position because your face is already distorted, you don't open the eustachian tube. You don't get this aeration of the middle ear. And of course, then you tend to get um, otitis media, and if this needs to be corrected, uh, we call it a grommet in the UK, but you just put a, I don't know what you call it, you put a bypass tube through the eardrum to allow aeration to the middle ear. So effectively, you've bypassed the eustachian tube. And it's because you're not getting the correct functional physiology, you're getting a pathological situation, that doesn't open. And that's one of the many features of craniofacial dystrophy. It's, you know, everyone's at the moment very co correctly um, highlighting this, the sleep apnea and the lack of space and the fact that generally you've got this broad reduction in cross-sectional area, you know, the structure's got longer, it's got narrower, it's got shallower, 
there's less space for the tongue, the teeth, and the airway. So you've got malocclusion, you've got sleep apnea. Yeah, this is a really good observation, but there are other effects of a face that doesn't grow correctly, as you say, like um, middle ear infections and hearing problems. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lustig, so I had talked to somebody about six months ago about the Warburg hypothesis, and they reminded me that it was a hypothesis. I was totally bought into it. Um, and so I wonder if you can elaborate on if it's cancer that creates an acidic environment or if it's the acidic environment that lends itself to cancer. All right, so the Warburg effect is not a hypothesis. The Warburg effect is an effect. What we've, what I put up on the screen is a hypothesis. Okay, we haven't proven that, although the um, uh, uh, supplementary data, the empiric data that exist, both in terms of uh, correlation and also in terms of mechanistic studies done in animals, support this. But it is still a hypothesis, no argument there. But the effect is, is the effect. Without question, the cancer cell makes the lactate. And the reason is because the cancer cell is not burning all the way to carbon dioxide. So it makes pyruvate. That pyruvate is either turned into uh, structural components or it will be released from the cancer cell as lactate. And that's why lactic acid builds up. Now, there are only three, count them, three uh, states where your lactate is high, your serum lactate is high. One is post-exercise for obvious reasons because you didn't get enough oxygen to your muscles to be able to you know, burn all of that in your mitochondria. The second one is cancer. And the third one is mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, like Kern-Sayer syndrome, Mila syndrome, um, MRF, uh, ragged red fiber syndrome. So basically, in each case, it's because your mitochondria didn't do their job, okay? And so anything that affects your mitochondria will lead to lactate. Well, cancer cells don't have mitochondria. They can't build mitochondria fast enough for as fast as they are growing. In fact, if you look at cancer cells, they are devoid. They're practically, they're, they're almost like no mitochondria there on purpose because they don't need them. So in fact, this is, you know, how cells grow. Don't do mitochondria because mitochondria are superfluous to growth because their job is burning. So that, you know, it, 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 the, the, the lactate is definitely a function of the cancer cell, but it's also a function of the fetal cell. So the Warburg hypothesis has been around for like 100 years, right? It's not a hypothesis, uh, it's okay. an effect. No, no, I, under, I understand <laughs> what you're saying, the, the difference. But the idea that an acidic environment can lend itself to can't, that has, that concept has been around for 100 years. Will it ever be proven? Right or wrong? Okay, I've, I don't know any data that says an acidic uh, uh, state can le uh, lend itself to cancer. I've never heard that. Um, and I know a lot about this field, and I've never heard that. Uh, cancers definitely make an acidic environment. No argument there, but I've never heard of it going the other way. There are a lot of states of acidosis, and they don't have an increased risk for cancer. Thank you. Uh, now we're going to get into the how do we fix it, what do we do about all of this section. And we're going to start with Shabon. Um, dental cavities, this seems pretty obvious how to fix it, but if you could elaborate a little bit on if we have these problems, what can we do right now to help decrease our chances of having them in the future? Well, I think it's unrealistic to assume that everyone is going to go back to an ancestral diet, so to speak. Um, we have an industrialized diet and many people live in industrialized society, but limiting um, super processed foods certainly would help. Um, I also will toss it back to the clinicians in the group and say that having a clinical perspective that is holistic and um, takes into account, as many of the, the folks have brought up, what a um, normal, and I'm using normal in the evolutionary sense, a normal face would look like 
when treating aspects of um, dental malocclusion, palate formation, jaw shape, and so forth um, is important. And some of the benchmarks for creating an ideal face orthodontically are based on agricultural populations and modern industrialized populations. And taking a look at those benchmarks, as I know some people are doing, um, and um, reevaluating those in the treatment of many of these um, uh, diseases and anatomical variants would go a long way towards helping people breathe better. Thank you. Kevin, what can we do about gestational apnea? Well, for one thing, when we talk about pregnancy wellness, it's more than yoga, it's more than folic acid or folate. Um, it is sleep and breathing, and it isn't just amount of sleep. When a woman is pregnant, she needs to oxygenate optimally, and that is through her nose. So this is not talked about. Even I have ob gyne parents uh, that bring kids to me, and I'll ask them, have you heard of this disease entity called, and, and really, I think, unlike Warburg, th this is a hypothesis, the gestational apnea hypothesis, but it, it does have a lot of support. So assuring that, and it may mean just giving a mom something called a boil and bite, um, you know, a, an oral appliance that helps them keep their jaw forward, their lips closed, myofunctional therapy. We have myofunctional therapists here, Joy Moeller's famous, and uh, Samantha, that there, there's pregnancy myofunctional therapy, myo muscle uh, function, and w with little kids we do it, but we need to optimize that when women are pregnant or pre-pregnant, and that's when it should start, and that means every woman <laughs> needs, because someday she might be pregnant or pregnant and doesn't know it. Uh, we talk about no alcohol, that's good. But how about nasally breathe air? Scott, how about for adults, if, if Kevin is suggesting this when we're younger, what can we specifically do? When we're younger? When we're older. When, I'm sorry, when we're older. Well, it's a little bit difficult, um, but that means most of us in this room, as you saw by my little bolt and tracing. So it means more of an interventional approach, doesn't it? Um, mewing works wonderfully well, but not so much in the 65-year-old, sorry. Not so good. So there are any number of interventions. It really depends on how far somebody wants to go. Um, so we go so far as to do a combination of orthodontics, which can even include expanders on adults, and there's a variety of them fixed with little mini implants, removable. Um, so a course of orthodontics and then surgery to actually advance both jaws and then a finish up uh, st stage of, of orthodontics. That would sort of maybe be the extreme. But it would still include, uh, a, and, and dentists are, are very capable of looking at how big the tonsils are. We kind of can't see the adenoids, so we would need to get an ENT involved, potentially, if that was the, the situation. But if you don't want to go that far, a, a, a simple appliance that I, I showed before that Lexi was wearing just to bring the jaw forward and take the tongue out of the throat. Um, when we sleep is really when apnea is, is, is a situation. Um, when we have REM sleep, uh, our brains are actually very, very active. And as a result, we, we paralyze ourselves. So when we're in REM sleep, we're paralyzed. And, and if the tongue is closer to the back of the throat, as in my case, okay, because you saw my jaws were too small, it's going to occlude breathing. And so if we can do something to bring the jaw forward, that sometimes is enough. And Mike, how about for craniofacial dystrophy? What can we do right now? What can everyone in this room do right now to help reverse this? Stand up straight and shut your mouth. <laughs> you know, this isn't a new idea. You know, that, that what I've said could be summed up with that phrase, you know, the wind will change. Shut your mouth or the wind will change and your face will set like that. You know, these ideas aren't new. You know, what Esther Gauclay was saying yesterday, it's, you know, myofunctional therapy. It, it, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a science behind such a simple statement to stand up straight, shut your mouth, eat your, eat your food with your lip, mouth closed. Um, don't speak when you're eating. 
You know, it, it's, th there's nothing new in what we're saying. If you're young, and I think we've got to be trying to get prevention, that doesn't totally answer what you're saying because you're asking me what can we do now. And a lot of people, the problem is that the, the, if the, your po oral posture and function has created your craniofacial form, then the most comfortable oral posture and function for you to exhibit is the one that you already have because that is comfortable in the form that you've created. So change is really difficult. Not only do you have the muscle memory, you've sort of got the structural memory preventing you from moving forwards. And sometimes that's where I would intervene as an orthodontist. But a lot of people with severe sleep apnea, I think are going to have to have bimaxillary surgery and more involved methods. Training it will only go so far. Thank you. Dr. Lustig, anything we can do right now to help improve our breathing, improve our health? So um, I have a question for all of you. How did mothers feed their babies before there was baby food? Exactly. Just like birds. They pre-masticated and dropped it into the little baby's mouth. That's how it was done. In 1901, Netherlands uh, company uh, made the very first baby food, okay, and it's been basically all hell's broken loose since. The bottom line is we used to feed our kids very differently, but we have been told by the food industry, oh, you don't want to give um, solid foods to babies because they'll choke. They didn't choke, okay? None of them choked, okay? But you know, we, we bought it hook, line, and sinker. And so now we have baby food and pouches. And that is, you know, sort of part of the problem. So as, uh, you know, Kevin, uh, you know, explained to me, sucking on a mother's nipple is very different from sucking on an artificial nipple in terms of the negative pressure put by the tongue onto the incisive suture in order to grow the palatal vault. Mastication, the four muscles of mastication, the masseter, the temporalis, the medial and lateral pterygoids, are basically pulling the jaw forward in order to increase that palatal vault. But we're not doing either of those because we're basically giving kids artificial nipples and um, uh, pureed uh, baby foods. Did anybody see the New York Times yesterday? There was an article about a study that just came out I can't remember where it was, but they actually measured, where was it? Manchester. Manchester, England, which uh, uh, measured the amount of energy expended in chewing. And it turns out that it's about f five to 10% of total energy expenditure. Well, if you're not chewing, guess what? You're gonna get obese, <laughs> no matter what you eat. So, um, you know, the fact of the matter is our processed food environment both at the neonatal level, at the toddler level, at the child level, and now we know at the adult level has, if not been the sole cause, has absolutely been a cause of this phenomenon, both anatomic and also functional in terms of chronic disease. So we got to rethink our food. Speaking of chewing and obesity, it's lunchtime, everybody. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you to the entire panel.